What's up, Periscope? Prop Dave Taylor here. Uh, yes, it's Friday instead of Thursday night. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Okay. Am I live on Facebook? Yes, I am. I'm live on Facebook. What's up, Facebook? Prophet David Taylor here. I know it is not Thursday night. I'm supposed to be doing my No More Genies on Thursday night. Uh, I had some issues with the water. You know, it literally rained all day yesterday. It rained from early in the morning until late at night. So I had some water issues that I had to deal with in the house last night. But things are good. Things are good today. So I'm here, so I'm going to do uh, my No More Genies right now. So again, apologize for it being late, but the Spirit of God has still given me something to say. So I'm going to say it, and I'm proud to say it, and I'm proud to release it because it's an honor and a privilege to be a part of God's kingdom. Okay? So let's say a word of prayer, and we're going to jump right in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for another day. We thank you for taking us day by day and step by step because you and only you have been sustaining us, oh God. Please fill me with the Holy Ghost. Forgive me for any sin. Wash me clean, oh God, and breathe through me, God. Speak through me. Let your words be in my mouth and let what you want said be said that you might be glorified in all things and that the saints might be edified and receive the word that you have for them through my mouth. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it. And we're going to tear down the devil's kingdom. We're going to stomp on the devil's head in the power of the Holy Ghost and in the name of of Jesus, we're going to dispel darkness and hindrance and disillusionment and error and deception. All that's coming down right now in the name of Jesus with the truth of God's word being prophesied, exegeted, preached, and taught. And we thank you for it, we believe you for it, and we declare it done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, so <clears throat> as you know, I've been working uh, on a series where I've been talking about the parables that Jesus taught. Uh, just a quick you know, recap of No More Genies. What No More Genies means is that we're getting away from our genie concept of God, where we've been taught that somehow God is magic and somehow faith is magic. And that's not what the word teaches. It's not magic. Okay? That's not what faith is. So we're, we're getting rid of that genie concept, that magic concept of rubbing the lamp, saying the magic words, you know, doing the hokey pokey and everything's going to be all right and getting into what the scripture actually says. And the scripture always has God's part and our part because that's the way God designed this from the beginning. God never designed us to be, let me get this mic closer to me if I can. It's Periscope, but I wanna get my mic here for Facebook. It's a little bit closer. Hopefully that's better. Okay, God never designed us to be uh, robots. And God never designed us to be puppets or automatons or marionettes or anything like that. So I know a lot of people want to believe that and I know a lot of people are kind of counting on that because they want to blame God for their actions but that's not what the Bible teaches. Literally, from the time we are created on the earth, God holds us responsible for our choices. Okay? So the Bible actually teaches that God has a part and we have a part. And so God will always do his part because he's faithful and because he promised and because he cannot break his word. But whether or not we do our part, where we fall in that equation is always up to us. Okay? Because it's a relationship. It's not a religion. And God is a person. Jesus is a person. The Holy Ghost is a person, not a set of rules. Okay? So that's why I do No More Genies, because there's been so much bad teaching that have convinced both believers and unbelievers that God's will, especially God's perfect will, or his best for your life, just automatically happens because God wants it to. And God is just moving the chess pieces on the board as he wills, and we don't have anything to say about the quality or the, excuse me, the quality or the outcomes of our lives, and that is not the truth. That is not what the Bible teaches in the slightest. Okay? All right, so... To that end, I've been teaching on the parables that Jesus taught because I've been teaching about, on, excuse me, the Lord's actual message. The message that we preach and teach in Western Protestant circles is get saved, get saved, born again, born again, born again, go to church, go to church, miss hell, miss hell, go to heaven when you die. That's what we preach. And we call that the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But that is not the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. Jesus didn't preach born again, born again, get saved, get saved. Uh, go to church, go to church, miss hell, miss hell, go to heaven when you die. <laughs> That's not what the Lord preached. The Lord preached the kingdom. He said the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. Therefore, behold, the kingdom of God is likened unto. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. That's what the Lord preached. He preached the kingdom. So I've been going over uh, many of his parables so we can see for ourselves what the Lord actually preached and taught. So tonight what I'm on is probably my favorite of the parables, and that's the parable of the ten virgins. The reason that it's my favorite is because it is so full of practicality, because it is just so plain in its message until you'd have to work hard to try to misunderstand what's going on with the parable of the ten virgins. So let's read that, and then we'll exegete, and then we'll prophesy, and... God will get the glory. So I'm reading out of the book of Matthew. Uh, Matthew was the first book in the New Testament. Matthew was one of the 12 that followed Jesus, and Matthew was a tax collector. Nobody liked Matthew, and nobody liked the tax collectors because they would always add a surcharge. So if the Romans were charging the people, let's say, 10%, the tax collectors would add an extra 5% and pocket that extra 5 and give the Romans their 10 So nobody liked the tax collectors because they knew what they were knew what they were doing but they couldn't really fight against it. So that's who Matthew was and Jesus called him anyway to be part of his twelve. That's right. Matthew worked for the Roman IRS. <laughs> okay? So Matthew chapter twenty five verses one through thirteen. I'm reading out of the NIV version. Okay? At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with them to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Wow and wow. Okay, so let's dive into that. Okay? So when the Lord starts out by saying at that time, he's talking about the end. The end of the age and or the end of the world where people are going to realize what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what that means. When he says at that time, he's key enough of what he said in the previous chapter. The kingdom of heaven will be like, will be like, will be like, ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay? <clears throat> he's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. Let's look at the number ten. The number ten is very significant in the Bible because it represents uh, a lot of things. Now, if you know anything about Scripture, you know that there's a very intricate, and I mean a very intricate number scheme in the Bible. And numbers are used to represent all kinds of things, and there are all kinds of uh, witnesses and fulfillments built into the numerical system of the Bible. One is the number of perfection. One is the num in terms of uh, self-sustaining, the number of the creator, the one who doesn't need anybody else, the one who is full and complete all by himself. Two is the number of witness. Three is the number of perfect witness, perfect witness of God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, perfect witness of man, spirit, soul, body, perfect witness of time, past, present, future. Four is a foundation number, the four corners of the earth, the four winds of the earth. Five is the number of grace and gifting. The fivefold ministry, four fingers and a thumb, God opening his hand, 
and extending his grace, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Six is the number of man we were created on the sixth day. On and on and on. So there's a very intricate number system. So let's look a little bit at the number 10. The number 10 is significant because it signifies law, responsibility, and completeness of order. It signifies law, responsibility, and completeness of order. Okay? There were 10 commandments. Okay? God gave 10 commandments to Moses, which, which was God was showing us our responsibility, what he had in mind, how it was we were supposed to live. And he gave us to 10 to show us that this is what was important to him. A tithe is a tenth off the top that represents the whole because it's our responsibility to honor the Lord of the harvest with our harvest, okay? And it's part of the law that we honor God with our increase. The Passover lamb was selected on day 10 of the first month, okay? Uh, another significant 10 is Noah. Noah was the 10th generation because time was up. I'm going to come back to that concept. Time was up in Noah's day. God had had enough of mankind and our foolishness, and it was the 10th generation, meaning that grace was up, and it was time for some law and order and judgment. Okay, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Okay, the 10 plagues of Egypt. That was God representing his complete and total, total judgment on the pagan empire because every one of the plagues of Egypt, uh, water turned into blood, plague of frogs, plague of lice, swarms of beasts, plague on the cattle, plague of boils, plague of hail, uh, hail, uh, hail cubes, hail bricks, hail stones, thunder and lightning, plague of locusts, plague of darkness over the land, and the plague of the death of the firstborn of both man and beast were designed to strike down the ten gods of Egypt. Each one of them represented and targeted a specific false idol of Egypt for the God of heaven, the God of Hebrews, the God of Moses, to show that he was above the false god, that he was above the idol gods. So it was his complete judgment on the Egyptian system. So ten is a very significant number. So in the context of the Lord talking about the parable of the ten virgins, it has to do both with the responsibility, because the whole point of this parable is that believers have the responsibility to stay spirit-filled and to stay ready for when the Lord shows up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into more detail in that. Okay? So that's the significance of the number ten here, that uh, it represents our responsibility, but also, like I told you, since Noah is the 10th generation, there always comes a time where God says time's up, where grace is up, where God closes his hand of grace, and then it's time for judgment. Okay? So I'm going to explain all that I'm saying as we go along. So the kingdom of heaven is like in the 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. That is a Jewish marriage custom that as a bridegroom would be approaching for the actual wedding feast and ceremony that the bride and the virgins in the party would go out to meet him bearing their lamps. That word is also rendered torches, okay, because they were uh, uh, brushes set on fire, but they were filled with oil. That was the significance of them continuing to burn is that they weren't just set on fire. They were filled with oil and the oil burned, okay? <clears throat> went out to read the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Stop right there. What did the Bible just tell you? The Bible just tells you, just told you that even as a Christian, you can be foolish. One more time. <laughs> the Bible just told you that even as a Christian, you can be foolish. Okay? So it says, the foolish ones took the lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. So on the way to meet him, it took a long time for him to show up and so they got sleepy and they fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And what that means is that they scooped off any residue, they scooped off anything in the top that wouldn't help the lamp to burn and make sure the pure oil could cover the leaves and the brush and the wood part so that the fire would burn bright 
and pure and steadily so that it wouldn't go out, okay? So that it wouldn't be snuffed out by any debris. That's what it means to trim the lamp, to get rid of. Also, if you're trimming uh, candles, to get rid of any part of the wick that will no longer burn or that's hindered from the burning or to get rid of any part of the top tip of the wax that might stop anything from burning or melting. That's what it means to trim the lamp, to get rid of any excess. Okay, so the burning will be happening without hindrance. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. Okay, so what's the real life practical application of this parable? How is the kingdom of, heaven of like, kingdom of heaven like this? Why would the Lord tell us these things and how to reapply it to our lives? Okay, <clears throat> it is foolish for a Christian not to be both spirit-filled and ready at all times. That's Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Verse 19, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Part of the requirement that Jesus left his followers and that Jesus has for us now is that we be spirit-filled, but also ready. Ready for his coming. But people keep teaching that like he's just talking about the rapture. The Lord is not just talking about the rapture, okay? Some people don't believe in the rapture. I'm not arguing that right now. That's another conversation about whether the rapture is an actual, literal, physical event or if it's a metaphor or, you know, a parable. I'm not dealing with that right now, okay? But some people that do believe in a physical rapture, a physical catching up into the heavens for believers, think that when the Lord says be ready, he's only talking about his second advent. His first advent was when he came through Mary's womb and was born as a human like we are. His second advent, if you believe in the physical rapture, will be when he comes from heaven and he stops in the sky. Okay, well that's actually not the second advent. The second advent is when he comes all the way down and sets up his kingdom on earth. Excuse me, I'm sorry I got that wrong. But those that believe in a physical uh, reappearing, that's the word I wanted, reappearing of Christ, believe in a physical rapture where he's going to come down as far as the sky and stop in the sky and call us up to him. That's not the second advent. The second advent is the millennial reign, which is another source of controversy. So, so sorry, I, I messed that up, but I hope I clarified it. So, but the point I'm trying to make is that it's not just talking about the end of the age or end time events or those two big events, the rapture and the millennial reign. That's not what it means. It means whenever the Lord shows up with whatever he's doing in this season, God shows up every season with a purpose in that season. And that's why he tells us to always be ready because whenever he's ready to move, whenever he's ready to do what he's going to do, he's going to tell the prophets first and then the prophets are going to tell the people and the people are either going to believe it or not. And so for you to be in tune with what the Lord is doing, You've got to be spirit-filled all the time, and you've got to be ready. That's the whole point of this parable, and it just amazes me how people miss that and how people miss teaching, okay? So I'll give you some examples. Uh, harvest season. If it's time to harvest, you had to have planted back in planting season. <laughs> you can't expect to harvest if you didn't plant when it was time to plant. What farmer does that? Okay? Uh, spouse season. There's going to come a season in your life, and sometimes it's a corporate season, where God is assigning mates, where God is assigning spouses, where God is saying, time to get married. And if you don't discern when it's spouse season, some people completely miss spouse season. I've seen it happen. Okay? Sometimes it's a season of death, like we're in now. A uh, season of judgment where judgment only comes for one reason, and that's to wipe stuff out. Every time you see the judgment of God falling, it always wipes stuff out. Solomon and Gomorrah, uh, 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 Pharaoh uh, in the Red Sea, uh, the floodwaters of Noah. So whenever the judgment of God shows up, it's always designed to wipe some stuff out, grace is up, there's no more discussion, there's no more talking, there's no more bargaining, there's no more pleading. The judgment of God is falling and stuff don't get wiped out. Okay, and so you got to be able to discern what season you're in, and that's why you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Only the Spirit of God, because remember, the Bible says that 
only the spirit of a man that's in him knows what's in him. In other words, God is saying, you know what's in your heart. You know what's in your deep inner chamber, chamber, and you're the only one that knows that. Nobody knows you like you, okay? Everything in you don't come out your mouth. There's plenty of stuff in here that folks don't know nothing about. But you know. Why? Because it's in your spirit. Well, that's who the Holy Ghost is to Father and Son. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of God. The spirit that's in God, the same way he put his spirit in us. And so the Holy Ghost knows what Father and Son are doing because the Holy Ghost is always listening to Jesus and saying what Jesus says. And Jesus is always listening to the Father and saying what the Father says. So the Holy Ghost is literally the only person in existence that would know what heaven is doing. That's why you got to say fear with the Holy Ghost because being filled with the Holy Ghost is not automatic. you got to ask for it every day. And there are many feelings. Many feelings, many feelings, many feelings, feelings, excuse me, many feelings of the Holy Ghost. It's not just a one time event, because some people tell you that too, that you only have to get spirit filled one time. And that's say, Oh, no. There were many, uh, many, many levels of anointing. I don't know why I'm talking funny tonight. There are many levels of anointing. David got anointed uh, more than once. Uh, there's, uh, as you grow in God, God sends different levels of the increase of the anointing, and you get more oil. So being spirit-filled is not a once-and-for-all event. Being born again is a once-for-all time event, the same way you're physically born and come out of your mother's womb, and you never have to do that again. And you couldn't even if you wanted to. You could bit more put yourself back inside your mom and come out again. Well, you don't have to uh, get saved 25 times once you come out of the womb of the kingdom of heaven. But being spirit-filled is something that you have to constantly do, okay? And the anointing definitely increases uh, as you grow in the Word, as you stay faithful to God, as you spend more time with Him. He will definitely begin to give you more oil and more anointing and increase what He's already given you as you walk with Him. So no, that's not a once and for all event. And so the whole point of this parable is the Lord said that it's foolish not to keep your lamp trimmed and burning as the old Negro spiritual goes, or filled with oil. The Lord says that's foolish. And he says that's the way some Christians live. They're not looking for the bridegroom to come. They're not looking for what God is doing in their lives right now. They're not realizing that God has a purpose in every season. Okay, Every winter, God is doing something. Every spring, God is doing th something. Every summer, and those are just the natural seasons. There's also seasons in your life. Like when you're a kid, God is doing something. When you're a teenager, you only have six years to be a teenager, 13 to 19, okay? And then you're in the decades, 20s, 30s, 40s. And in every season of your life, God is doing something, okay? But the only way that you can know what he's doing is that the Holy Ghost has to tell you. The whole, it only comes through revelation of the Holy Spirit. And that's why you have to stay spirit-filled. And that's why you need to be around the apostolic and the prophetic. Because that is the core of that anointing, is getting a rhema word, hearing what the Lord is saying right now. That's what apostles and prophets do. That's the nature of that anointing. Okay? And so the Lord said, as a believer, if you don't live that way, if you don't live spirit-filled and ready for, for whatever move of God he has going on, he said, that's foolish. So he said, the wise ones are the ones that take oil in their jars to be sure they can keep their lamps burning, to be sure, in other words, that they're full of oil and that their fire is burning and that they're ready so when the bridegroom shows up, they can go in. Okay? Midnight, the pride rang out. Here comes the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. The wise uh, said, the, the foolish said, give us some of your oil. The wise said, no, may not be enough for both us and you. He said, go to those who sell oil and buy some from for yourselves. Okay. This whole thing speaks to being unprepared. You're out somewhere, out the will of God, trying to get some Holy Ghost, trying to get some oil, trying to get a breakthrough, trying to do something that you should have been doing in, in the will of God. You should have been preparing for the Lord to show up. You should have been in the Word. You should have stayed spirit-filled. You should have stayed in the prophetic flow. Because as you've heard me say on this broadcast before, the Lord told us that famine along with pestilence was coming years ago. And I know, again, more knowledge about it dropped last summer. Summer of 2019, God was speaking through the mouth of the prophets and telling us that the pandemic was coming. 
okay? So that's why you hear me say all the time, I know people think prophets are crazy. I know people think the prophetic is crazy. I know a lot of Christians that speak against it. A lot of people speak against the apostolic and the prophetic. I read the other day when somebody was saying there are no apostles today. Incorrect that there are no prophets today. Incorrect. The whole Bible was written by apostles and prophets, and the whole Bible is apostolic and prophetic. And there are apostles and prophets right now. But many Christians don't believe that, and so they get caught unawares. That's why the Lord said it's foolish, because he said when he's going to do something, he's surely going to tell his servants the prophets who's going to come through the prophetic. Whether you like it or not, whether you think that's fair or not, whether you think it's right or not, don't have nothing to do with nothing, because that's what God said. Surely he's not going to do anything unless he tells the prophets, unless he tells us. And so it's foolish of you as a believer to be off somewhere out of the will of God when you should have been prepared and in the will of God in the path of the Lord. Can you see that? Can you see that from the text? In the path of the Lord, in the path where the Lord is coming, in the path of where the Lord is going, you're supposed to be ready and prepared to walk in that path. But if you don't have no oil, you off somewhere trying to get some fake Holy Ghost, trying to buy something, trying to get something that ain't even real. How, how do you think so many Christians get caught up in all this stuff that's not even real? Because you're not spirit-filled. You're spirit-filled. You can be more discerning to understand that, that everybody talking about God don't know him. And everybody singing about heaven ain't going. Okay? That takes the Holy Ghost. That's not a function of man. That's a function of the Spirit of God. But if you're not spirit-filled, you're going to be off somewhere out of the will of God. Okay? And so the wise virgin said, we're we going to be about our business. We're going to handle our business. We're going to take make sure we got enough oil to keep our lands burning. And y'all going to do what y'all going to do. So they did. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Now you need to understand the significance of what these, these verses are saying, you need to understand the practical application. What the scripture is saying here is that what I told you before, like in the days of Noah, there's going to come a day when the Lord shows up and whatever was going on before, that's over. Okay, I personally have experienced that many times in my life. I was just talking to my son about it the other day. Okay. When there's a season in your life and it's over, God will spiritually shut the door. Okay, he says that in Revelation. I'm he that openeth and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man openeth. What do you think he's talking about? Okay, so there will come a time in a season. That's what happened in the days of Noah. There will come a time in a season where God says time is up, grace is up. Okay, the Lord's going to move forward and the door is going to be shut, on, and everything that used to be is over, and it's time for something new, because God uh, shut the door on all the people that were alive, except for Noah and his family. They all got wiped out, and Noah had to start over, okay? So uh, <clears throat> it's, what's the word I want? It's not incorrect to teach about God's mercy and grace and God is a God of a million second chances because he is. That is not incorrect, but that is incomplete because it's not open-ended and many times that's the way it's taught. Okay? Because you can't be too bad, you can't be too good, you can't be too young, you can't be too old, you can't be too rich, you can't be too poor, you can't be too educated, you can't be too ignorant. But you can be too late. Okay? You can miss God. That's the balance to the teaching that God, his mercy endures every day because it does. And that he gives us grace because he does. And he's a God of a million second chances because he is. But that principle must be balanced with the fact that you can be too late. You can miss it. Because the door is not going to stay open forever. Okay? Why do you think the Lord says in Hebrews 3 and 7 and Hebrews 3 and 15. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, and Hebrews 3, 8 says, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. Uh, Hebrews 3, 15, as it is said, today 
if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Okay? So what that's saying is that when you hear God calling you, when you hear the Lord speaking, when you hear the Lord saying something to you, respond right away. Don't harden your heart. Don't close your heart. Don't be full of unbelief. Don't tell God no. Don't turn a deaf ear. Don't turn away. Do you know why? Because you don't have forever. <laughs> you don't have forever to get yourself together with the Lord. Whoever told people that, that is not correct. You do not have forever to get yourself together with God. You've got to get the Lord while the getting is good. You've got to get your opportunities while the getting is good. I'm going to give you some examples in the Bible of people that missed it. Okay? One of the people in the Bible that missed it was Esau. Esau was born, the firstborn of uh, Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, Esau and Jacob were twins, and Esau came out first. That means he was the oldest born son. That means the birthright, the blessing of the father, was his. Well, that family line, the Hebrew patriarchs, were chosen by God and so blessed by God that God referred to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and it was supposed to be Esau. It could have been Esau, but Esau despised his birthright and sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. It therefore became the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Esau gave up that birthright because at the time it didn't mean anything to him. He didn't say, what I, what I need is, he literally said, what I need is birthright for. I'm finna starve. I need some food. So go ahead, Jacob, take it, whatever. Give me some soup. And he sold his place in history. He sold his divine destiny for a bowl of soup. It would have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau had he not done that, but Esau missed it. You want to know who else missed it? King Saul in the Bible. He missed it too. First of all, the children of Israel were not supposed to be in a monarchy. They're not su supposed to be under a monarchy. God said, I will lead you directly. They said no, and they kept worrying the Lord. So finally the Lord said, okay, you want a king? I'll let you have a king. God said, that's a mistake, but I'm going to let you have it. The first king, King Saul, was the king that the people chose. People chose. The second king was King David. That was the king that God chose. Okay. But anyway, King Saul was double-minded. He did a little bit of what God wanted and a little bit of what he wanted and a little bit of spirit and a little bit of flesh and a little bit of obedience to God and a little bit of obedience to the people and a little bit of getting rid of all the pagan things and a little bit of keeping all the pagan things and a little bit of destroying all the stuff that God said destroy and a little bit of keeping some of the stuff that God said destroy. He was double minded and God got so tired of that until God cursed him with schizophrenia. God said, I'm going to take the kingdom from you and give it to a neighbor that's better than you, which was David. And God let Saul live long enough just to, call, just to go crazy and to see King David on the come up. Because Saul absolutely missed it. God told him, even though I didn't want a monarchy, if you had obeyed me, Saul, I would have established you and your house forever. Lord have mercy, when I read that, my heart just froze. God told Saul, you could have had an eternal place in my kingdom, even though I didn't want a monarchy. But if you had obeyed me, Saul, says God, I would have established you and your house forever. But God said, yep, nope, nope, time's up. I'm sick of you and your double mindedness. I'm sick of you and your two minds about everything. I'm sick of you and your wishy washiness And some days you obey me and some days you don't. And sometimes you do what I say, sometimes you don't. And sometimes you do half of what I say and you do half of what you want. The Lord said, I'm sick of that. So what did he do? He tore the kingdom from Saul and gave it to David. That's how David became the king. Saul missed it. You want to know who else missed it? The first generation that left Egypt under Moses. It wasn't just Hebrews, by the way. There were actually some Egyptians. Read the scripture. There were some Egyptians that left with Moses and the Hebrews. Then people saw all the ten plagues of Egypt. They saw uh, all the quail in the wilderness, the water come out of the rock the manna fall from heaven, they saw <clears throat> the Red Sea part, excuse me, they saw Pharaoh being blocked by a pillar of fire, and then Pharaoh got drowned in the Red Sea, they saw God lead them uh, with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, and then people got to the edge of the promised land, and they said, we can't do it. <laughs> they got to the edge of the promised land and didn't make it in because they wouldn't believe God, and God got sick of them, and God said, Yo, these how many times? These ten times. Have these people rebelled against me? And God said, that's it. That's it. Grace is up.
time for judgment to fall. And God said nobody over the age of 21 was going to go forward except Joshua and Caleb. Because Joshua and Caleb believed God. They heard the Lord's voice when it was time to hear it. They didn't harden their hearts. They believed that they could take the land, and nobody else did. Okay? And all the people over the age of 21 died. They missed it. They went through all that to get out of Egypt and all that to make it through the wilderness and didn't, didn't make it into the promised land. So don't tell me that you can't miss God, and don't tell me that you can't be too late. Yes, you can. Okay? So that's why I'm beseeching you, my brothers and my sisters, those of you that are not Christians that are hearing my voice right now, I beseech you as you're listening to me now, you need to get saved. You need to get right with God. You need to turn from your own way of thinking and your own way of living and turn to Jesus Christ. Accept him as your Savior and learn to make him your Lord and you will live. You will live both in this life and forever in the life to come. Okay? Uh, and the way you do that is the ABC. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe that he is the Christ. He died on the cross for your sins and rose again the third day. And C, confess that with your mouth as you are believing in your heart. Those of you that are already saved, I beseech you, my brothers and my sisters, to accept him as Lord, to learn how to do what the Lord says do on a daily basis, to stay spirit-filled and to stay in step in the path of God so that whenever the Lord is ready to do anything in your life, you're on top of it. You're spirit-filled, you discern it through the prophetic, you got confirmation words or the Lord spoke to you directly, and you know what God is doing, and you're in the path, and you're on it. You see what I mean? Because if you don't do that, my brothers and my sisters, and you're off somewhere out of the will of God. A lot of people, by the way, have missed their spouses, if you didn't know that. If you've ever heard some people tell me, how come I can't find? A whole lot of people, they miss their spouses. God sent them in your life, and you missed them. You missed them because you were somewhere out of the will of God. And you only had so long to give it that person, and then the door shut. That's why you can't find them. That's why you're going to grow by yourself. Maybe. Maybe the Lord will have mercy and bring them around again, and maybe not. Maybe if they come around again 20 years later, they won't want you now. That's possible, too. So that happens to a whole lot of people. A whole lot of people that want to get married, they miss their season of getting married because they wouldn't listen to, the, to what the Lord was saying. So they miss their spouse altogether and end up picking somebody that was all wrong for them or wasn't the right person or somebody that you've got to agree to marry you, which isn't the same as being in a relationship that God has ordained for you. That, that, that door does not stay open forever. Because none of God's doors stay open forever. Not even the door to heaven. Why do you think people go to hell? Because they thought that the door to heaven just automatically stays open. No, it doesn't. You've got to get saved in this life while you have a chance. And if the pandemic has taught us anything, although you should have learned the lesson from 2016, 2016 is when the death horseman dropped in America. Remember? 2016 started off with the death of David Bowie. Remember? And people have been dying left and right ever since of all age ranges. This pandemic is just another level of that. You understand? So what I'm trying, what I'm working very hard here to get you to see is that you do not have forever to accept the offer of God. You do not have forever to get right with God. And you're off, if you're off somewhere as a believer out of the will of God, trying to get some fake Holy Ghost, trying to buy something you should have had, doing something you ain't got no business doing, and you're not in the path, the Lord will come in, shut the door, and you will miss it. Miss what? Whatever he was doing in that season of your life, whatever God was trying to accomplish in that season, once he shuts the door, the past is over. Don't you know that there are so many people still very young that had to go back to school just to finish high school and they realize it and there's nothing wrong with getting your GED. Don't misunderstand me. But a lot of those people have regretted that experience because they realized I should have graduated high school when I had the chance. Don't you know that there are a whole lot of people that are just one class away from finishing their degree but they never finished? And a whole lot of us go back to school as adults. Do you know why? Because a lot of adults, everybody doesn't mature at the same rate, but a lot of adults realize I should have got a degree. I should have I should have finished my uh, higher level uh, and secondary and advanced education while I had the chance. Okay? And so the doors don't stay open forever. And when God is done with something, when God is done with a generation, 
when God is done with a person, when God is done putting up with people, when God is done traveling, whatever the Lord was doing on his way to where he's going, when he's done with that, he's done. And he's going to move forward with the people that are ready in spirit field and that are going to go with him. And all the people that were all the Christians is not talking to sinners. All the Christians that were off doing something else that they shouldn't have been doing because they weren't spirit filled and in the will of God are going to get shut out of that blessing, that move, that event. It happens all the time. 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 Uh, I'll give you another example. Some people. See, right before you get ready to get really blessed, the devil's going to hit you super hard. That does not fail. Whenever there's a huge blessing and a huge elevation and a huge drop from heaven coming, a huge answer from heaven coming, the devil hits you super hard. And some people give up right before the end. Well, you can't get the medal if you don't finish the race. If you want the gold, you got to finish the race and come in first. If you want the silver, you've got to finish the race and come in second. If you want the bronze, you've got to finish the race and come in third. What's the common factor in everything I just said? That would be finishing the race. You've got to finish, not start and give it your best. You've got to finish or else there are no medals for you. This is what the kingdom of heaven is teaching. This is what a lot of believers I have discovered do not understand. That they think they just automatically get the prize. No, you don't. You have to finish. Okay, so it says that, uh, so when the Lord has shut the door, the door is shut and you have missed out. Again, that's why a whole lot of people are going to grow old by themselves. They wanted to be married, but you didn't listen to the Lord when he was trying to tell you when it was your season for marriage. Now you ain't going to never get married. Some people. Some people will. Many people won't. That was not God's perfect will for you, but you missed it. Okay, how many times has God dropped an idea in your head or your heart and you said that's a good idea and you didn't act on it and later on you see somebody develop that idea and made a lot of money off of it. That's supposed to be your money. God gave you the idea, but you didn't take it seriously and you didn't go and start that business. You didn't develop the idea. You didn't put your work in and the Lord gave it to somebody else just like he gave Saul's kingdom to David. This is Bible. That's why I call what I do on Thursday. I know it's Friday, but I normally do on Thursday nights. No more genies. No more magical thinking. No more thinking that we don't have anything to do with our destinies. Yes, we do. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. What a thing for Jesus to say. He's talking to Christians. What did you say, Prophet Taylor? I said, he's talking to Christians. What does the Lord mean when he says, I don't know you? Just what he says. We were never intimate. We never spent any time together. I heard Bishop Jake say it one time, and it was so funny because it was so true. Bishop Jake said, how you going to say, how you going to call yourself married, and we don't have sex no time? I love that because he's right, because there's a whole lot of people having that sex in years ago. They say, I'm married. How you going to call yourself married? And you're not getting busy with your spouse. You're supposed to get busy with your spouse. Okay? And the Lord says, we were never intimate. Because, you hear me say it all the time, God's a person. He's not a set of rules. And just like the reason you like being around your best friend is because y'all spend time together. Because y'all hit it off when y'all first met. Because you found out you had things in common. Because you enjoy each other's company. And you're closer to your best friend now than you were when you first met. Because of the time you put in. It's no different with God. I know you think it's different because God is all-powerful, almighty, uh, you know, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, because he's all the omnis, but he's still a person. So stop trying to figure it out. You can't figure God out. You just have to believe God. Okay, you're going to never be able to understand everything about God up here. It's not going to happen. God did not call you through the mind. God called you through faith, through belief. Okay? But God is a person. He's not a set of rules. And you have to spend time with him. You have to get to know him just like you have to get to know any other person. Okay? And so when the Lord says, I don't know you, that means we ain't spent no time together. We ain't never made love. The Lord said, we supposed to be married. I'm the bridegroom. We supposed to be the bride. We ain't had sex no time. 
That's what the Lord means. You've never been intimate. Never poured out your tears before the Lord. Never fasted before the Lord. Never cried out before the Lord. Never released your anger and your frustration before the Lord. Never cried out to God because of your enemies. Never opened up your heart and shared what was going on in your life. Going on in your life and going on in your soul and going on in your mind. Never opened yourself up and intimately poured yourself out before Jesus, the lover of your soul, so you all could fellowship, so he could comfort you, so he could love you, so he could speak soft words of encouragement, so he could give you of his grace and of his power. You don't have that kind of intimacy with the Lord, and you don't know him. And Christians live like that, really don't know the Lord. That's why so many of them go to church, but they mean. How are you going to go to church all that time and be mean? You just got religion. There is no other explanation. The meanest people in Jesus' life were the religious people and the religious leaders. They didn't know him. Do you see how all this stuff lines up? All this stuff lines up. The Bible lines up. People always talk about how the Bible contradicts itself. No, it all lines up. The meanest people in Jesus' life, remember that Jesus is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. The meanest people in Jesus' life were the religious people because they did not know him. They were about rules and regulations. They were about dotting the I's and crossing the T's. They were about the letter of the law, so they completely missed the spirit of the law. They were so busy obsessing over what God said, they never bothered to find out why God said it. Because you have to ask him why. And all they had was religion. They didn't know the Lord. They didn't even recognize that was God in the flesh. So the Lord says he's talking to Christians. He's saying, if you don't spend any time with me, we're not intimate. You and I are close. Okay? I don't know you, and you don't know me, and you're going to miss his move, and he's going to shut the door, and you're going to be outside knocking on the door, talking about, let me in, let me in. Then the last verse, verse 13, therefore keep watch, there it is. Okay, God said, being ready, be watchful, be ready all the time, because you do not know the day or the hour. The day or the hour of what? Of his coming. But it's not talking about the rapture only. And it's not talking about the millennial reign, the second advent only. It's not only talking about that. It's talking about what he's doing right now. Because as I said before, through the prophetic, the Lord told us that the pandemic was coming in summer of 2019. But actually further back than that. But as recently as summer of 2019, God was already, already talking about what's happening right now. That's right. Okay. And the Lord says, you don't know. You don't know how many days you have. You don't know which day is your last day. People that die and they didn't, you know, some people commit suicide, some people check out on purpose. But some people, when they wake up, they didn't know that was their last day on earth. Some people don't make it out of the womb. I just had a friend of mine and she had a miscarriage. And I'm not, you know, she put that on Facebook. She put it out there. So I'm not, you know, telling anybody's business. She put that out there that she lost a baby. And she's so sad. And every time I see a Facebook post, I, I just feel so bad for her. I just feel so sad. You know, I'm not female, so of course I've never been pregnant. I don't know what it's like to have a life growing inside of me. But um, she's, she's in grief. She's in mourning. Because some people don't make it out of the womb. Some people don't get any days out here. Some people spend their days inside their mom, and then they expire in there. They don't actually come, get to come out here and, and breathe and walk and talk and and all the things that sometimes we take for granted. So when the Lord says you don't know the day or the hour, you don't know when he's going to show up, you don't know when the Lord's going to say that's it, the Lord might say that's it, it's time to be blessed, like he lifted up Joseph. Then Joseph knew when that day was going to come, Joseph just had to be ready. Because when Pharaoh called Joseph, he called him out of jail, Joseph had to shave, Joseph had to shower, Joseph had to clean himself up, and Joseph had to not have an attitude. Because if Joseph had been bitter or angry at God, and he had gone before Pharaoh with an attitude, he might have messed up that whole blessing. But Joseph had a humble spirit and said that God should give Pharaoh an answer of peace, and that's how he got blessed. We have to live the same way. I know we don't always like it, but it's always true. You don't know when God is going to open a door in your life. You don't know. If you're looking for a breakthrough or for things to blow up, you don't know when things are going to blow up. I remember Bishop Jake said, when he moved from West Virginia to Dallas to start the Potter's House, he said that his first service, he had people wrapped around the building. He had so many people, he, he had to do a couple services, so he couldn't let them all in, all in or 
he had so many more people than he was anticipating because a lot of his congregants came with him along with his family from West Virginia. But he said there were so many people in Texas that were already ready there to, to hear him and be a part of the potter's house. And he said he didn't anticipate that. So, so, so the point I'm trying to make is that you don't know when God is going to do anything you don't know. So the Lord says he wants us to be ready. All right, my brothers and my sisters. So those of you, again, that are unbelievers that are listening to me now, you need to get saved right now as I'm talking. Do not delay. You don't know if you have tomorrow. You don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. None of us do. Get saved right now. And those of you that are Christians, you're believers, you've already accepted him as Savior. I beseech you and I urge you to accept him as Lord, to stop living any kind of way you want to and get in line with him. That only happens through spending time with him. That only happens through spending time in his word. That only happens through being spirit filled because we can't even go to church in America right now. In most states, I know some states are beginning to relax their restrictions like I know they just did so in Wisconsin. But the vast majority of us that are, you know, regular church attenders, we haven't been in church in a while and we still can't go to church yet. We certainly can't hear yet in Chicago. Okay, so we don't have the fellowship of the saints now in person like we normally do. We have the fellowship of the saints online and that's it. But you can sp still spend time in the presence of the Lord. You can still spend time in his word and you can still get spirit filled you and the Lord in the room alone together. So I beseech you and I urge you to get in line with him and let him become Lord of your life, of your every decision to order your steps. So that way, when it's time for the wedding feast, when it's time to celebrate, when it's time for, for the wedding supper, when it's time for the breakthrough event that God was trying to get to, you'll be right there with him as opposed to the Christians that don't do all that and are somewhere out of the will of God and miss it completely. All right, amen and amen. That's tonight's prophetic word and prophetic lesson. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, let me see. Okay, all right, here little Doris, I didn't see you there. God bless you, uh, so glad you're joining. Um, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. Uh, uh, put them on the screen on Periscope, put them on the screen on Facebook Live. You got any prayer requests? When you see me, uh, close my eyes. I'm praying in tongues and I'm asking the Holy Ghost if there's anything else He wants me to release. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do now. Okay, the prophetic word the Holy Ghost just gave me is, for those of you that hear and receive this word, better days are ahead. So for those of you that hear and receive this word, better days are ahead. Amen and amen. And God bless. I receive that. I'm excited about that. I want to stay in step with him so I can get to them better days. All right? Amen and amen. I believe that's it. Okay? So uh, today for New Music Friday, I did... Uh, I'm going to release my uh, EMP, uh, three songs and three videos, really soon. I will let you know when that happens. Uh, I will be back this Sunday at 2.30 p.m. in my regular time for the weekly live prophetic word. So thank you for joining me tonight for No More Genies. God bless you, and uh, hope you receive the blessing in the word, because it's truly a blessing when we listen to the Lord. Okay, God bless you. Have a great rest of your Thursday, and I will talk to you Sunday. Amen and amen. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning.